just uh, very briefly, uh, I will tell to you that, as you might have seen on the bio, we have Lauren Passarelli, who will be uh, performing first. And Lauren ha writes and sings and plays many instruments. She arranges, produces, engineers, mixes, and masters her music. She has nine CDs and two EPs and 11 singles with, for the Feather <laughs> Records. She was the first woman to graduate as a performance major from Berkeley College of Music in 1982. Uh -huh. and I hope that in the Women's March today, that's it. That will go out there. And the first woman to be hired on the Berkeley guitar faculty in 1984. She's written two ebooks for guitarists that you can ask her about. And she was just named one of the top 10 most inspiring music professors in the US for 2017 by College Magazine. And, the, um, and she is here to share some of her creative process with you today. And she is joined by Kate Jadborn as well. Please welcome. Lauren Passarelli. Okay. Now, Lauren. <laughs> Everybody. So that's a song called Reaching for Love that we ended up doing uh, as a co-write without Kate knowing it. <laughs> I start these tunes and sometimes I'm looking for extra lyrics and Kate has this way of writing a poem every single day for National Poetry Month in April every year. And she presents me with a stack of poems at the end of the month like, oh, there's just a couple things I threw together in April. <laughs> And I'm always amazed at all these words, you know. And, and so that's one of the keys. I spend so much time playing guitar that I have tons of guitar ideas. She plays piano, harp, and all these cool things. But she also plays with words and reads constantly. So she's just full of words, full of words. <laughs> if you're playing with words, you'll come up with words. You play with a bass, you'll come up with a bass line. You know, so I thought, let me pilfer some of her poems and see if there's any cool lines in here that I can put into to finish this tune. Free lines are always a good way to finish a song. 
<laughs> it makes the songwriting process a lot easier. And so it turned out that I excerpt a few lines from her poems, from several different poems. I don't even remember which ones they're from. Neither does she. We'd have to go through and find them again. But on my website, I highlighted which ones they were in blue, so we'd know that these were Kate Chadbourne lines. And there was one line in the, in the verse, but also plenty of lines, the whole chorus. And it's interesting because when you read something, it gives you a different meaning because it's relating to what you're thinking about and what you're working on. So I was able to find lines that I thought fit it perfectly. And they were pretty juicy lines like, uh, here we go again, heartache. Hello. That's, that's, a good, <laughs> that's a good phrase, you know. So thank you, Kate. We did a co-write without you knowing it. And <laughs> no, work, no work for me, you know. <laughs> yeah, she likes those kinds of co-writes lo a lot. So that's the thing. Where do you start, right? The subject is absolutely infinite because you can start anywhere, and a song could be about anything. So for me, something has to trigger me. I have to feel inspired by something, and sometimes it's just a chord. I hear one chord, and it makes me want to write a song, you know? And I have a song called Tomorrow's Touch that just starts with this. And I'm, I'm gone. I'm, I'm just floating away thinking, that I like that. I have to go follow that. So the same thing happens with a phrase. One time we were having dinner and, and someone said to me, uh, oh, no, I, I said, boy, she was the greatest waitress in the world. And my friend said to me, <laughs> I dare you to put that line in a song. And I ended up <laughs> writing a song called Hose and Iris because of a photograph that a friend had sent of a literal garden hose <laughs> with an iris plant in it. And she called the picture Hose and Iris. And I thought, that's a perfect title for this crazy song I was writing when I was trying to write a You Can Call Me Al song. Because they were, there was an article in the paper that said Paul Simon has, writes about the darndest things. So I thought, let me write a song about the darndest things. And I tried to put in a whole bunch of lines like John Lennon's I Am the Walrus, where he kept a piece of paper in the typewriter, and he just added a line when he thought of something quirky to say. So I was writing this You Can Call Me Al tune, and it turned out to be a song called Hose and Iris. And I stuck in that line. She was the greatest waitress in the world, you know. And I thought, this song isn't going to make any sense. But by the time I was done with it, it made sense. It, it kind of floored me, you know. But that's the thing about language, and that's the thing about intent and the things that come from your heart and the things that come from your thoughts and your life and what you're living. So someone like Susan G. Wooldridge writes books called Poem Crazy and uh, Fool's Gold, and it's all about paying attention to language and how words sound and playing with words like they're blocks. You know, it's really easy on the computer now to take a word and cut and paste and just make any kind of sentence you want. And you think, oh, I'm fooling around. I may be putting the adjective in the wrong place or whatever's happening. But sometimes something very poetic happens. So you can play with words as blocks. And I found uh, with the suggestion of a couple of good writers a few years ago that if you let yourself do some free association, you have plenty of words to play with. So take a blank piece of paper, fill it with anything. I don't even know what I'm going to say. I don't know what I'm writing. I don't know why I'm doing this. This is stupid. This is never going to end up in a song. <laughs> and you let it all happen, <laughs> either on the computer or with a pen, you know, however you like to scribble words. And I just fill pages and pages of some of these things. And every once in a while, a gem drops out, pops out. Uh, one of those was a, a, a title called uh, Wish Upon Me. I was probably trying to think about things in which <laughs> something magical would happen, you know, like what, what, what can you possibly write? But you, you don't think anything's going to happen. Uh, Natalie Goldberg says you've got to prime the well. So if you keep your pen moving or you keep that typewriter going and words are playing, things pop out. And you look at it right now, you don't see it. You don't even think there's anything good there. You give it a couple hours or a few days or a month and you go back when you've got a guitar idea that you don't know can I sing about? Let's see, is there anything in here? There's something about attaching my attention to a word and the syllables that happen at that time as I go to sing that word or that phrase that invokes a melody. If I'm just la 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 it might be a boring melody. But if I'm doing it with words, all of a sudden the words, because of the rhythm of the words and all the syllables that you're about to speak, it already has a shape and a rhythm. And if it makes sense because of language, I can get a better melody out of it. So one of the things that's fun uh, is to ask my students every once in a while, 
when they say, I can't think of a melody or I can't think of what to, how to sing this phrase. I say, just give me a sentence. You got a book? You got, open up a page or give me your favorite chord. Give me a sentence and I'll sing it. And they're always like, you know, how did you do that? But it's because you start to pay attention to the way words flow and the rhythm they, they, they uh, take up. That's, that's called prosody or prosody, however they pronounce it. And so that's a very fun way to get more words into your life is just free associate. Sometimes I free associate even on the actual subject I'm trying to write about. The other times, and I'm sure because you all play something, a couple of instruments and things, switch instruments, play, play an instrument you don't normally write on. I've been recently writing a bunch of songs on piano. And the other day, uh, the dishwasher started. I was taking care of that. And that's a good, good time to think of lyrics. Sometimes when I walk away from a project or get out of the studio for a second, go put in something domestic, <laughs> like laundry or dishes or something, and words start to happen again because you get away from the actual trying so hard to think of something. They come to you while you do something else. So the dishwasher starts up and it's playing a B flat. <laughs> I didn't know it was a B flat, but I'm hearing this drone. I'm like, hmm. And I start singing this melody and I thought, find that melody on the piano. I went down, started playing the piano, and wrote this song, called it the Dishwasher Song. I thought, <laughs> cool instrumental. Weird title, but good instrumental. You know. So then I played all the instruments and recorded that, and that was so much fun. So on guitar, there's a lot of variety, a lot of variety, because we have all these beautiful open chords. And then we have triads that you could put over different bass notes that you wouldn't normally play. We have big open voicings that you could call like voicings and tenths. And so I remember loving good old Blackbird, right? And Paul was actually trying to play a Bach tune that he didn't know how to play. He was trying, trying to play Bach's beret. And he didn't know it, so he thought, oh, just write me on, you know. <laughs> good old Paul, that's all he'll do, right? So I thought, I would love to write a song that has like Blackbird voicings in it. So I came up with this, just fooling around with shapes, just putting my fingers anywhere, trying to find something cool. And I was just recording the mess I was making, and I thought, oh, it's too late. I got to go to bed. There's nothing here. And I thought, well, don't be too discouraged, you know. <laughs> I woke up the next day and listened to the recording. I went, wait a minute, the, most of the progression is there. You're fine. You just need a title and some words. You're done. It's good. <laughs> it sounded like Jerry Seinfeld. <laughs> so uh, my niece... His name is, her name is Bella, short for Gabriella, and she was one at the time. I wanted to write her a lullaby. I thought, I'll call it bella mm -hmm. And I came up with this little. When you call my name When I feel you smile Laughter sees me in your eyes bye bye bella bye 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 bella bye So that was really fun. And I thought, well, the guitar then can kind of give you ideas and clues as to where to go next. So every once in a while, I hear a really cool riff, like a. Well, she was just 17, right? Very cool riff. Could I write a riff song? I would love to write a riff song. So then you're playing around with who knows what. and found this I thought, can I sing over that while I'm playing at the same <laughs> time <laughs> problem problem right a little stickiness so I recorded it figured out what chords I wanted to play and then thought about what kind of words and where the melody would go and then I had to learn how to sing and play it together 
<laughs> and you're doing it in slow motion. You go, yeah, this is possible. No way. It's good. Yeah, I think I could. No. Yeah, and then finally, uh, one more time. This time is too many times. There's no road, no expectations. Dance now. Don't keep it down. You can't hear what you won't listen to. I thought, that's not bad. I can do that. That's okay. So that's a song <laughs> called Your Own Dance. And then sometimes there's like chordal riffs, you know, because there are ways in which you can play chords and melody at the same time. People aren't doing that these days on guitar too much. They're all just, you know, playing lead, you know, or just playing chords. But they don't do the stuff in between. And chords and melody are something that piano can do and guitar and vibes and marimbas, but not too many other instruments can do it. So why play it monophonically when you have access to all these, these notes and all these colors? Um, sometimes it's a favorite chord. One student came in one day and played this chord. She said, what is this? I went, whoa. It just sort of melted, you know, like, I got to go home and write a song right now. Like, yeah, just give me that chord. What do you got there? You know? <laughs> and it's sort of like a minor nine with a couple of extra open strings, giving it a richness with that minor second in there, you know. But as soon as I heard that, I wanted to play and play around with the bass line. Then uh, I was writing a song called Blast of Love, so I thought, why don't I just sing the title? I, you know, try that. It's a blast of love. You're a blast of love. It feels a blast of love. You're a blast to love. That'll work, that'll work. Part of it is not judging the little idea or the little the little riff or the chord idea or the lyric too soon. You gotta sort of stay out of your own way enough to trust and allow yourself to play and, and, and develop it into something. It's like a little seed and you don't wanna step on it and crush it too soon and doubt it or, or give it an inferiority complex by putting <laughs> it down, you know, or putting yourself down, right? That's That's always the worst. So I try to imagine like, well, what would Paul write here, you know? Or what would John Lennon say here? Um, in fact, I did that once. I paraphrased a John Lennon line, you know, in Julia, where he says, uh, half of what I say is meaningless, but I say it just to reach you. Mm -hmm. Turns out I think he took it from another poem, but I thought it was his, so I was like, wow, John can write anything. You know? And we, we think this about our heroes, you know, like they never get stuck. They're always brilliant. They're amazing. But we're just as amazing. We're all magic inside. We're all wizards. And if you let that flow and turn that on, you feel limitless, you know? So how do you tune yourself? John said, half of what I say is meaningless. And I was trying to write a song where I was trying to encourage a person to stay well. So I wrote a song called Hold On. She was dealing with a major, major illness that could have killed her. <laughs> and she's a good musician, you know? I thought, I want to write a song, but I don't want it to be corny. Don't die, don't die. You know? <laughs> And, and yet I was still so upset over it, too, that, you know, I thought, I can't really just, it's not about me. I'm not supposed to be all upset about this, you know. Like, but I, I do want to encourage her to stay, good for my own selfish reasons. <laughs> and so I said, how can I paraphrase that line, but I say this just to reach you. And I, I, I actually came up with, um, it, it just pops into your head. When you ask a sincere question like that, the idea comes. And I said, um, I sing to be near your heart. Oh, that's good. And back on, I, I saw her standing there. I loved when Paul sings, uh, Will, will my heart went boom when I crossed that room? I thought, oh, that is a good line. My heart went boom, you know. <laughs> Who hasn't felt that? Wow. You know, I hope everybody feels that. That's so good. How can I steal that line? How can I say something like that line? And then I came up with, uh, I want to be the boom in your heart. 
Oh, that's a good way to just make it your own, you know. <laughs> so all these ideas, a lot of people come up with little lightning ideas. Little thing pops into their head as they're walking through the field, they're whistling a tune, you know. I've had tunes come to me that way, or you're playing another instrument, but then all of a sudden, like I'm playing drums, but background vocal ideas are coming to me. I'm like, oh, hang on, let me sing the background part. What do you do to finish a tune? Everybody knows how to sort of start one. I have this little thing I don't know what to do with. What do I do? You gotta practice finishing. <laughs> James Taylor actually says that he sits down with lots of little things. Pieces of words, pieces of music, listens to his little tape recorder, all the little ideas he's got. And he goes, do any of these fit together? Maybe I'll just make a quilt, you know, and just put a few of them together. And that's a great thing. That's a great way to finish it. Another tip is always to stay in the moment. If you're feeling a certain feeling, and you're, you're coaxing out a couple of lines or a couple of chords and something nice is happening, don't answer the phone. Turn the phone off. Don't, don't go watch your favorite show. Tape it or something. Watch it later online. Um, you know, stay in the moment. Stay in the feeling place of it because that's the hardest part. It's not, I don't know where it's going to go next. It's, I'm not sure of how to conjure that feeling again. You know, so if you're in that moment and it's feeling delicious and something is flowing, don't even think about, it's flowing, it's flowing, oh my God. You know, like, uh, I hope it lasts. Oh, you just sort of killed the vibe a little bit, right? You don't want to shoot yourself on the foot, but you're, you're appreciative of it and you're loving it. And I think that's the main thing, is just allowing yourself to have fun and love the process, love that you're who you are and that you've got something to say or that you're creating a sculpture or you're doing a painting, that you get to paint. You know, you love your tools, Kate taught me. There's a very nice phrase. I, she loves her pens and her, her instruments. And I love my microphones and my guitars and my instruments. And it's like, I get to play with these. I would have killed to have all this stuff when I was 11. You know, like this is, <laughs> this is amazing, you know, to be okay. us now in this life and get to do this. And so as soon as you start putting in that love and remembering to connect to the word, to connect to the moment, connect to the feeling, or connect to the chord, connect to the fact that you just love playing this thing. Then all of a sudden, something starts to rise from it. This magic starts to happen again. And I think it's born out of appreciation and born out of the flow of lo life and living and, you know, what we desire and how we're, we're here to create something, but we're not sure what. It's like you're making a puzzle and you haven't seen the box top. You just have a piece. And you're like, that's not a puzzle, it's just a piece. I don't even know what this picture is. You don't have to. That's the cool part about it. I love sitting there with a blank piece of paper or blank recording and knowing that in an hour or two, something's gonna be there. That just blows my mind. You know, <laughs> this is the same power that creates worlds and we're using it to like write songs and woohoo, that's awesome. <laughs> woohoo. I'm waiting for my thing to go off. Oh, it says I have one minute and 58 seconds left. Oh, is that just a warning or do you want me to go? <laughs> <laughs> You're done, Passarelli, that's it. Thank you, we'll phone you. <laughs> so delicious chords, right? Find chords that you like. Um, you know, when you walk into a store to, to buy, a, like you're looking maybe for clothes or something, but you see a whole rack of the same thing, but one stands out to you for some reason. That's the color. For some reason, you don't even like the color, but that's the one that goes, woo, that's the one I want to buy or try on. It's the same t thing to me with an idea for a song, <coughs> a title for a song, a, um, a chord in a song. If I, if I choose them because I really like them and they, ma they matter to me, at least in that moment, I can change my mind if I want to. There's nothing wrong with that. But choosing them for a reason, even if I don't know what the reason is, it just feels good. That's a good enough reason, right? So if I could leave you with anything, it's don't doubt yourself. Have fun with it. Remember any of the songs you've ever enjoyed writing before and just try to remember what that felt like. Play some of those. Remember that you're a wizard, you know, and you have all this access to all these good things and that you can do this. And uh, scientist? Somebody say scientist? <laughs> Uh, and, and that's it. That's really all it is because you can do sculptures that way, you can do paintings, you can 
design a house, you could be an architect. It's the same thing. You could be the best medical professional. To get an idea, it all comes from the same place. I think that's it. It hasn't even cricketed yet. 12 seconds to crickets. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Over to you, Kate. <laughs> yourself feeling down in winter or if you experience depression through the year does it get worse in the colder and darker months I'm here to tell you about winter depression and what you can do that may be helpful seasonal affective disorder or sad is a type of depression that tends to occur in the fall you may lose your energy and motivation you may feel sluggish agitated distracted hopeless and you may have problems with sleeping your appetite or suicidal thoughts sad can lead to social withdrawal problems with school or work, and substance abuse. Here's the good news. You can talk with your primary care physician, your psychiatrist, or mental health professional. There are effective treatments such as counseling, light box therapy, or medication. Sometimes we feel bad in the fall and winter anyway, especially during the holidays. But if a mood slump continues for days or weeks, don't wait. Talk with your doctor or counselor for more information and support. My name is Kurt. My name is Nina. A gun? I'm Haley. Hi, hi, David. Jake. We're the Hiller Volleyball Team. My name is Emma. My name is May. My name is Shelby. My name is Sophie. We're Al and Gal, and we love H Camp. I love H Camp. And I volunteer for H Camp TV. And I watch H Camp TV. And I love H Camp TV. And I love H Camp TV. We love H Camp TV. This week on From the Vault, PAW's Who's Next, a 1998 wrestling show hosted by Dave Violet and Jeff Wharton, featured a dozen wrestlers that competed in backyards and wrestled on trampolines. Pace is just too big. The referee has spent more time with Superfly than watching the match. And, and what just happened there? Look at this. Destruction won't tag him. And this oh. allows Cactus to get a nice submission hold on. And he pulls the arm back to keep him from tagging now. 